What's up, AP Psych? Welcome back. We're getting into our final video on Unit 5, States of Consciousness, and it's a big one. Uh, psychoactive drugs. It's a lot to talk about, a lot of things to go over, a lot of topics to discuss. So make sure you have your notes out. Take your time. Rewatch if you need to. Come back to it. This would be a great section to pair with your reading guide as well. So let's jump on in. First, a psychoactive drug uh, is defined as a chemical stuff substance that alters perception and mood or affects our consciousness, right? So any of those things that we ingest that can alter our perception, change our mood, um, and alter our brain chemistry is the big thing about psychoactive drugs. They actually physically change what's happening in our brain to produce certain effects. Dependence and addiction in terms of psychoactive drugs. So if you're taking a psychoactive drug and you continue to use it, that produces something called tolerance, right? With repeated exposure to a drug, the drug's effect lessens. So thus it takes bigger doses to get the desired effect, right? That's tolerance. If you look at this graph down here, this is the dopamine response to a particular drug. I want to say cocaine maybe, I can't remember, but a similar effect for, for most drugs. You take this drug, Dose one, boom, you have a massive dopamine response, right? That reward center in your brain fires. The second dose, though, is almost half as effective, right? And so you're always, what they say, drug, uh, drug users are always chasing that first high because there's nothing like it in terms of your brain chemistry response, your dopamine response, and it takes more and more of the drug to get even close to that first time, right? So as, as you continue to take it, you become more tolerant, you increase the dose, you get more tolerant, and that re cycle repeats. And oftentimes that is what can end up in um, people sending, sending people to the hospital or overdose situations or death. That can also lead to, if your tolerance increases and you continue to use, can lead to addiction, right? And this is where we have a craving for a chemical substance despite its adverse consequences, physical and psychological. Right? We know that it's doing bad things to us, but we want that dopamine hit. We're addicted to it now. We want that same feeling. So you go back and you keep using because you are physically and psychologically addicted. Your body needs it and your mind is telling you, yes, I need it. Your brain chemistry is telling you that you need it uh, because you've been replacing certain neurotransmitters with these drugs and they're no longer producing them the same way that they were before. That's addiction and tolerance. As that continues, if you decide to stop that and try to break that addiction, what makes it extremely difficult for people um, is not only the fact that they're addicted physically and psychologically, it's when they stop, um, they go through withdrawal. Users experience undesirable effects of withdrawal. It can be um, mood changes, teary eyes, shivering, muscle aches, runny nose, headaches. Um, any of those things are examples of withdrawal, and these are just symptoms of withdrawal for heroin specifically, right? But across drugs, they can show many of these similar symptoms when you go through withdrawal. And then you go back to the drug just to relieve these symptoms of withdrawal so you can feel better. Um, and then you're stuck in this terrible cycle. And that's why relapses occur, right? People want these drugs, they're going through withdrawal, they can't handle it. Um, and eventually leads to dependence the absence of a drug may lead to feelings of physical pain, intense cravings, physical dependence, and negative emotions, depression, anxiety. All of those things can happen if you become addicted to a drug and dependent upon it and you stop using it. Those withdrawal symptoms kick in and get you to relapse and go back to it because you feel that you need it. All right, so we're going to get into our types of psychoactive drugs. The first type, the first section we're going to talk about are depressants. And these are drugs that reduce neural activity and slow body functions. So don't think of depressants like you're in depression. No, it's not about that. It's about slowing down your brain activity and slowing down your body's functioning. And those include alcohol, barbiturates, and opiates. Those are the three types that we're going to discuss. So first, you have alcohol. In low doses, this relaxes the drinker by slowing down the sympathetic nervous system which lowers our inhibitions and our judgments, right? Sympathetic nervous system, remember, that's our fight or flight response. So it slows that down, we're, we're not as ready to react. Um, we are, we're slower, we're not as fearful of things, less inhibited, okay? Um, and in high doses, our reactions are even slower, speech slurs, and skilled performance tends to deteriorate, okay? We've also seen um, 
effects on memory by disrupting the process of recent events and its translation into long-term memory. This is when people drink way, way too much and they experience blackouts, right? Their hippocampus effectively stops working, doesn't take in new memories during that time. Uh, it also reduces self-awareness and focuses one's attention on immediate situation rather than future consequences. You don't think down the road, you're thinking here and now, and you're not gonna remember anything you do if you're taking in alcohol in high doses. This is something that unfortunately a lot of teenagers are familiar with. High school parties are a popular thing in which there tends to be a lot of alcohol consumption occurring. Um, so you may be familiar with seeing some of these people or some people in these states as a result of alcohol. However, long-term use of alcohol can lead to alcoholism and it can severely impact the brain. Here's a scan of a woman with alcoholism and her ventricles are expanding. So she has literally lost brain function as a result of the drinking of alcohol compared to a woman without alcoholism. You can see the difference in the uh, ventricles and the, the blank spaces. So how does the body react to alcohol? Well, generally it takes about one hour to metabolize the alcohol in one drink. Okay, one ounce of 80 proof liquor, four ounces of wine or a 12 ounce beer, it takes our body about one hour to metabolize that. However, there are differences in gender women metabolize alcohol much more slowly than men. If a woman and a man of the same weight consume the same amount of alcohol, the woman would be more intoxicated than the man due to the way their bodies are composed, right? Men have much more muscle mass, which allows alcohol to be metabolized faster. And women tend to have higher body fat contents, which keeps alcohol around in their system longer, okay? So you can see here, if women and men were to drink same size, same weight, same age, um, the same amount of drinks, women would become eventually significantly more intoxicated over the course of a night. Our next group um, is barbiturates. This is a drug that mimics kind of similar to the effect of alcohol. It depresses your central nervous system and in larger doses can actually lead to impaired memory and judgment. And they used to use this quite a bit uh, in medical situations. They don't use it as much anymore because it is highly addictive. Um, it was most commonly used to treat things like seizures, epilepsy, anxiety, insomnia, conditions in which you're trying to depress the central nervous system and calm it down. Um, some examples were phenobarbital, which helped with seizures, um, and secobarbital, which was like an anesthetic. Um, again, they don't use them very much anymore because of their highly addictive nature. Next up, we have opiates. Opium and its derivatives, morphine and heroin. You may um, also be familiar with things like Oxycontin and um, the painkiller Vicodin. Um, these all depress neural activity, temporarily lessening pain and anxiety. Also highly addictive, right? They're the entire opioid epidemic is based on doctors over prescribing narcotics such as Vicodin, heroin, morphine, Oxycodone, um, Oxycontin, things like that. They are endorphin agonists, okay? They work and mimic the effects of endorphins, that pleasure-seeking, pain-seeking part of the brain, um, pain-reducing, I should say, part of the brain, is what, which is what makes them so addictive, right? Pleasurable, and they help reduce pain, right? So it, it, people get addicted to them very, very quickly and easily. Of those, heroin is the first one we're going to touch on. The user gets a short-lived feeling of blissful pleasure can last three to five hours, um, followed by craving for another fix. Heroin is one of those drugs that you can get addicted to the first time you take it, right? It can be that powerful. Um, the need for progressively larger doses and physical withdrawal symptoms increases with use, right? So tolerance increases, that means you need to take more heroin, and eventually leads to overdoses. You may have heard of places called um, methadone clinics. Methadone is, is often used when trying to combat a heroin addiction. Um, at the dosage is given, the individual does not get high, yet it is enough to reduce the intense physical cravings and withdrawal symptoms. So it's helpful for people trying to overcome a heroin addiction or stay away from a relapse. However, it's kind of like uh, the lesser of two evils as people can become addicted to methadone as well. All right, our next category is stimulants. And these are drugs that excite neural activity and speed up our body's functions. So they are the exact opposite of the depressants that we just talked about. Some common ones in here that you have probably partaken in, caffeine, right? And then we have some others like nicotine, cocaine, ecstasy, or MDMA. 
amphetamines and methamphetamines that we'll touch on each of those as we go. So caffeine and nicotine, two of the most commonly used legal psychoactive drugs. Um, they both increase heart rate and breathing rates and other autonomic functions to provide people with energy. Caffeine is the most common um, drug used in the world. And nicotine, you'll see smokers oftentimes um, going out for a smoke to get some energy because that nicotine in their uh, cigarette stimulates them. Right? Just like those Juul cigarettes um, that many, many teenagers struggled with over the last few years. Um, they're super addicting because one of these e-cigarettes has more um, milligrams or nicotine um, content than a pack of cigarettes, right? It's that strong and powerful. So you can see why people would get addicted to those very easily. The recommended amount of caffeine per day is 250 milligrams. Keep this in mind for our next slide. You can see some of you out there who are drinking those bang energy drinks or Red Bulls or whatever the heck they are now. Those could be up to 200 milligrams, okay? Coffee, anywhere from 80 to 100. Think about how much coffee you're drinking a day, things like that. Um, adults should have no more than 400 milligrams a day. So many people pass that, right? Three, four, five cups of coffee a day, two, three energy drinks a day, right? People are heavily addicted to caffeine. So caffeine, like we mentioned, is found in coffee, tea, soda. Chocolate has small amounts of traces of caffeine and many over-the-counter medicines. Most people use caffeine in some form every day. It is considered the most widely used psycho, um, psychoactive excuse me, drug. Um, it increases attentiveness and improves mood by blocking a neurotransmitter known as adenosine. This is a neurotransmitter that builds up every hour you're awake, more adenosine builds up in your brain and it makes you sleepy and tired by the end of the day. People use caffeine to block adenosine receptors so your brain doesn't feel tired or sleepy. The only problem is that adenosine is still building up in your brain. You're just not feeling it. So it's increasing and increasing and increasing. If you don't sleep to wipe away that adenosine and start fresh the next day, you could have serious cognitive um, consequences, which we somewhat reference in our sleep presentation. Caffeine is physically addictive. Individuals can experience withdrawal symptoms if you stop intake, usually from a few days to a week. You'll have headaches, irritable, drowsy, tired, especially if you're a regular coffee, tea, or soda drinker. So I know there's some of you out there right now who drink coffee every single day. I would challenge you to try to go without it for a few days and see what happens. See if you get irritable. See if you have headaches. And you'll know, yep, I am physically addicted to that caffeine that I drink every day to wake me up. At high doses... It can produce anxiety, restlessness, insomnia, and increased heart rate, known as coffee nerves. If anybody out there has never, not a coffee drinker or anything like that, or not an energy drink drinker, and you take it in for the first time and you got those like jittery hands and you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, or you took a pre-workout or something like that because your friend convinced you to, and you're not used to caffeine, that high dose could have produced some of these side effects. Next up, we have amphetamines which is also known as speed or uppers. These can suppress your appetite um, and were once actually prescribed as diet pills, believe it or not. Um, no longer prescribed because of tolerance to its appetite suppressant effects occurs very quickly, meaning the individual needs more and more of the drug to maintain its effects. And that's what makes these very dangerous. Tolerance happens fast and need to increase their dosage to feel those effects. It also can increase concentration and, and reduce, excuse me, fatigue. But that also increases anxiety and irritability as well. So these drugs have a number of side effects, positive and negative, depending on what you're looking for. Within that subset of amphetamines is meth, crystal meth, meth, methamphetamines. Um, it's an illegal drug manufactured in street laboratories. It's either smoked or injected. If you've watched Breaking Bad, you know a little bit about this, right? Um, as with all amphetamines, after using for a while, you'll crash, right? You'll exhibit withdrawal symptoms, fatigue, deep sleep, intense mental depression, and reduced appetite, right? It's highly addictive. After effects include irritability, insomnia, hypertension, seizures, periods of disorientation, and occasional violent behavior, right? Not a lot of positives to take in meth, right? 
Over time, it appears to reduce your baseline dopamine levels, leaving the users with permanently depressed functioning. And this is why it is so addictive. It changes your brain's chemistry. Your brain does not produce as much dopamine any longer and you're depressed. And so what happens? You relapse. You're like, I can't take this anymore. I need, I need another hit, right? Because I need this mental issue to go away and you become addicted. Um, there's a famous website out there called the faces, many faces of meth. You can take a look and you can see what happens to people over time when they first start and after years of meth use, okay? Jaundice skin, changes in facial structure, loss of weight. Oftentimes people will have scabs and sores on their body from picking at their body because of the impact and the effects of meth. Horrible drug, a lot of issues. Next up we have cocaine. Uh, it's an illegal stimulant derived from the cocoa tree. Uh, its derivatives such as Novocaine are used today in anesthetic. It is true that cocaine was part of Coca-Cola's original formula back in 1888. It was replaced in 1903 by caffeine, which is a legal psycho, um, psychoactive drug. Yet, cocoa leaves with cocaine extracted for medical purposes are still used today as a flavoring in some cola drinks. So they still use cocoa leaves, but they extract the cocaine part of those. Um, when inhaled or snorted, it reaches your brain in minutes and it produces this intense euphoria, even less than minutes, um, and mental alertness and self-confidence, which can last for several minutes up to a half an hour, um, usually 10 to 30 minutes. If someone's a binge user, that time goes down and they have to continually use that because their tolerance is up, they're used to it, they need more, and they need it more frequently to reach that intense euphoria and mental alertness that cocaine provides. Cocaine also blocks the reuptake of dopamine, so the brain is flooded with these dopamine-produced pleasure sensations, and that is what can make dope, um, excuse me, cocaine addicting, right? The change in brain chemistry, it's all of these rewards you get from an overflow of dopamine, and that's why people return to cocaine over and over again. Also in this category, ecstasy, MDMA, maybe you've heard the term molly, all of those reference the same thing. It's a stimulant and also a mild hallucinogen, so it can fit into two categories. It increases empathy. You're feeling like you can connect with others and feel what they're feeling, peacefulness, and the person feels calm or relaxed. It's kind of paradoxical though, because they also seem like they have unending supply of energy and they could go forever. And that's what makes it a very popular club drug, a rave drug. Um, the, however, that also makes it very dangerous because the immediate dehydrating effects combined with prolonged physical activity in the club like dancing causes a person to risk severe overheating, increased blood pressure, and if it gets bad enough, potentially death, right? So ecstasy sucks that water out of you and it really that's the dangerous part of it. Uh, researchers have found also with prolonged use a decline in memory and IQ. And they believe that MDMA can cause long-term serotonin changes in the brain, um, leading to reduced serotonin levels and increased risk of depression. So there we are again, seeing the brain chemistry alterations that these drugs produce. And that is why we become dependent on them because our brain is used to the, those drugs taking the place of those important neurotransmitters and the brain no longer produces them. Our final type of psychoactive drugs are hallucinogens. Hallucinogens are psychedelic, meaning mind manifesting drugs that distort perceptions and evoke sensory images in the absence of sensory input. So for example, common things such as LSD provide people think they see these hallucinogenic psychedelic images of different geometric shapes, or all of a sudden the person they're talking to, their face might start melting or something like that. Things that aren't actually happening in reality, they're hallucinating them um, through their different senses. Our first example, just mentioned it, LSD or lysergic acid diethylamide, I can never say that, um, or also known as just acid, right? One of the most powerful known drugs. It only takes, get this, one millionth of an ounce, tiny, tiny, tiny bit to produce mind altering effects, okay? This was first synthesized 
from rye fungus by a Swiss chemist in the late 1930s. They were actually experimenting with drugs to try to simulate what it may be like to have schizophrenia so that they could more effectively treat it. But he accidentally ingested a minuscule amount of the substance, and he had the first ever LSD trip. And since then, it has become um, one of the most powerful and most common drugs over time. Any trip um, could last 6 to 14 hours, and the effects can vary greatly depending on the person, the environment, and their expectations. So visual distortions and hallucinations are common, seeing geometric shapes, seeing lights shining, seeing halos, seeing things around you change when they're not actually happening. And the emotions accompanying those things can be very intense and unstable, and you can have impaired thoughts, including paranoia and things like that, which can lead to a bad trip. Um, and these are terrifying for users because they're in a state of panic and they feel like they're going to go mad and they're never going to come out of it. Right? And as a result, some of these things can end pretty tragically in accidents, deaths, or suicides because people believe that they're stuck like this forever and their world is forever changed and they can't get out of this bad trip. So something tragic happens as a result. There's also something that can occur with acid or LSD called a flashback where after people have taken it, weeks, months, even years later, they have these sudden, without warning, brief reoccurrences of the trip. Um, and it, they flash back to moments of you know, geometric shapes or lights for some reason or something happening to the person they're speaking to. And it could last for a few seconds. Um, and it's just flashing back to those experiences they had when they were on acid. There is like a, an old wives tale that acid stores itself in your spinal cord. And if you crack your back or something like that, it'll lead to these flashbacks. That's not true. The flashbacks just occur as a result of you having done this at a, at a certain time in your life. Next up, we have marijuana. Uh, marijuana can actually be classified, depending on the strain, as a stimulant, depressant, or hallucinogen. We keep it in the hallucinogen, and hallucinogen category because of the THC in marijuana, which is the ingredient that produces the high and can lead to some hallucinogenic effects. So this produces a feeling of elation, promotes relaxation, relieves inhibitions, relieves anxiety, and increases sensitivity to sights, sounds, and touch, right? And it can also cause a sense of time to be distorted and not understand how long you've been doing something or where you've been. Um, THC, or I'm gonna try this, tetrahydrocannabinol uh, is the ingredient that produces the high. 10% uh, of it remains in your system after seven weeks after use. Okay? And that's why it's uh, effective for some companies. Um, when they drug test, they can easily find it because marijuana stays in your system for a long time. At this moment in time, it still is technically illegal in the United States as it is a federal crime. However, many states have legalized it for medical purposes and recreational purposes. Um, so there's a little bit of, of a debate there as to whether it should be classified as a illegal drug or um, legal at this point in time. Some of the effects impairs attention and coordination, slows reaction time, interferes with concentration, logical thinking, and your ability to form new memories and your ability to hold in mind what is said. Right? It is not as dangerous immediately as some of these other drugs in terms of the risks of death and the physical harm. However, some of these long-term effects and the immediate impacts, such as slow reaction time, attention and coordination and interfering with concentration can lead to accidents and many driving accidents do occur because people are driving while high on marijuana. Uh, the chronic use is associated with loss of motivation and general apathy. And that's why they say baked or half baked, right? You're just generally apathetic. Your mind has slowed down. You don't seem to care. Uh, can also cause physical issues in your body like respiratory damage causes that faster than cigarette smoking and heavy abuse can impact your reproductive system especially in males. So while marijuana is a uh, popular recreational drug and many people claim it's not physically addictive, it does have these negative impacts that can occur as a result of use. So that wraps up all of our psychoactive drugs we we're gonna discuss. We hit on them pretty well, I think. Um, if you need to, you can pause here and get a really good synopsis of all of the ones that we just talked about. Um, you can do that if you need to. The last thing we wanted to touch on um, the use of drugs is based on the biological, psychological, and social cultural factors. 
So this is a perfect example of biopsychosocial, right? Some people are predisposed to addiction because of their genes. That's a real thing, right? But the way a drug impacts you also has to do with your psychological state of mind when taking that drug and the environment that you're in when you take it. Okay, so, so drugs are a very biopsychosocial um, reliant thing. And it's something to definitely keep in mind when you're thinking about people who are addicted to drugs or taking drugs and the impact that they're having on those people. Um, there are many factors that influence how it affects people. So that kind of wraps up our um, psychoactive drug notes. If you got any questions, please let me know. We'll do some activities in class to apply and understand them a little bit further. Have a good one.